doesn't matter whether your gap revenue says you made a ton of money. If you don't have the cash, you still can't pay people's salaries, okay? And so you're kind of dead in the water. Um, so I'm pretty frugal. In fact, I got a little bit of a reputation for being extremely frugal. Um, but it works, okay? And especially when you're a startup. If you want to get, this goes to, kind of applies even if you're getting VC money. If you go out and raise VC, there, there's two fundamental ways you can do your startup. You can bootstrap it, i.e., which is basically do it on a shoestring, get some money from your friends, relatives, uncles, fathers, brothers, cousins, whoever you can. Um, or you can kind of say, hey, I've got a really great idea. We're going to spend a few months prototype it, and then we're going to go spend a tremendous amount of time driving, walking up and down uh, um, Sand Hill Road and try and get somebody to give us a bunch of cash so that we can have a party and go and spend their money and have a great time. That's not really how it works, right? The reality is, is that the, um, the cash comes from the VCs, but you really need to treat it like your own because as soon as you run out, they're going to be happy to give you a little more, but there's a really high cost to that, and it's a personal cost to you. You're going to be giving up a lot more ownership and control. Um, but sometimes you need to do that. You need to get outside money. I've done, I've raised venture capital nine times. I've started seven companies. Four of them were bootstraps. Three of them I venture funded. Um, I've had fun. I probably had more fun in the ones that I bootstrapped because it was all on my shoulders. Um, and I've made a heck of a lot more money on the ones that I bootstrapped um, than on the ones that I did with venture funding. Um, but you need to make a decision about which way you want to go. Um, one of the great things about trying to go and do a venture when you're coming out of school is that you're used to living on very little money, right? Students get by on, you know, I don't know what a student lives on these days, but I don't know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, something very modest. Um, once you get a little older and you get a fancy car and a big house and you know other people who are depending on you, um, then it becomes a lot harder to go without salary. Um, something you can do in your 20s. When you get later in life, it's actually a lot harder. And so you end up having to go to the venture capitalists so that they can fund you, and um, you've got to pay that price. Um, at Barracuda, I, I did the initial funding of Barracuda. It was very modest funding, um, but it worked out really well. Um, Barracuda was absolutely a bootstrap. Um, the founders, the employees, um, all of the folks who basically contributed to the company, owned probably 60% of the company even after it went public, okay, which is somewhat unheard of in the traditional realm. Um, you know, I brought venture capital into Barracuda very late in the game um, when the company would ha already had $50 million in revenue, which is, you know, a really high number in the scheme of things, um, primarily because two of the folks that were key executives wanted some liquidity. Um, Anyway, it's all fun. Um, with Eagle Eye Networks, I'm going to fund it myself and um, go the bootstrap route. OK, so first principle is find a problem. Second principle is, make, um, is basically watch the money. And the second, third principle is make sure you make your customers happy. OK? Customer service is really important, um, and that means your customers are going to do two things. They're going to tell you what you should be doing. Okay, Customers are great. They are the best product managers, the best source of data on earth, because they will tell you exactly what you need to do to make your product better, stronger, faster, greater, and get more customers. You just need to listen to them with a few caveats once in a while, because occasionally you do get customers who are a little, little out of the box, <laughs> and you got to know that. Um, but you really need to spend a lot of energy making them happy because those customers will talk to other potential customers, okay, whether they be consumers or in the business world. The people in the same roles all talk to each other. They go to conferences. They have friends who they worked with who changed companies. They call each other and they ask. And if you have a reputation for really making your customers happy, either giving them great support, great product, however you're doing it, it's really important. Um, that word spreads, and your success will continue. If you make your customers and you don't deliver for your customers, okay, it doesn't matter how crazy their demands are. If they're unhappy, your long-term success is in jeopardy. 
Okay. So the fourth kind of principle in the uh, in the Draco uh, how to build a business is to measure your results. Okay. So as an entrepreneur, you're going into a new business. You've never been in this business before. Okay. You're reaching new customers, you're talking to them, you're learning stuff, you're building a product that probably never been built quite the way you've been building, you're building it. Okay, it's all new stuff. Okay, and so you're blazing a trail. But, and so you have a lot of experiments that you're running. You use a lot of the scientific method, or at least I do. Other people probably, you know, have it all figured out and just use their, you know, crystal balls, but what I do is I run a lot of experiments, and I keep those experiments small. You know, we want to do a marketing experiment. Okay, we'll spend a few thousand dollars and see if that works. We want to change the product this way. Okay, well, let's change it that way and show it to a couple customers and see what they think. Okay, and so you're doing these experiments constantly to basically try new things. As a startup or as a small company, you can do these experiments very quickly. Okay, because you can move quickly. It's fundamentally the one advantage, one of the many advantages that a startup has over a large company is that you can move really quickly. You can make decisions quickly and you can execute quickly. You can execute a whole bunch of experiments and figure out what the customer wants or what's going to work for the sales model or what marketing techniques work or what's going to motivate employees. All kinds of areas where you're running these experiments. But what most people don't do is rigorously measure the results, okay, with a little chart or a little count or some real statistics, okay. This is something that engineers are much better, off, better at than marketing folks and sales folks, okay. But you need to actually apply some rigor to measuring the results. If you do that, you'll end up actually continuously optimizing what your company is doing and you'll find success. The fourth, or the fifth principle that I came up with in trying to answer this question of how do you do a successful startup was um, plan for success, not an exit. Okay? Too many people are talking about what's your exit strategy, what's your exit strategy, and you haven't even figured out what your sales strategy is. Okay? You got the cart before the horse. Okay? You shouldn't be talking about an exit strategy. You know, my exit strategy, people I always say, my exit strategy is the grave. When I die, I will exit. <laughs> okay? Um, so you need to focus on actually how do you get the company successful. Okay? Don't think about exits. Exits come. You know, that's not what you want to be thinking about. The VCs will be talking about it. They'll be asking you, what's your exit plan? Especially, actually, inexperienced angel investors, inexperienced venture capitalists will start to throw that question at you. What's your exit strategy? It's like, well, you know when somebody asks you that question, you know they don't know what's really going on. <laughs> okay? It's a clue. All right? You need to actually get the company built and successful. Focus on the customers. Build the success. And exits will, will, will come your way every day. Okay? Um, I can assure you that. So, uh, if you boil that all down, it's focus on a real problem. Okay? Watch your cash. Make sure you have cash coming in. Spend frugal. Make your customers very happy. Adapt and measure your results of what you're doing. And build for success, not for an exit. OK. So I was also asked, what were some of the critical moves or decisions that I made? Um, and what was my judgment looking back on them as I moved through my really long career? Um, interesting question. Um, the first thing I did when I left Berkeley is I actually went and worked at Apple Computer for three years. Okay. I worked at a big company. At the time, Apple was 10,000 employees, which um, looking at Apple today seems minuscule. Um, but back then, that was considered a big company in tech. Um, and I did a lot of learning at Apple. Um, I actually poked around and uh, did things that most people didn't do. 
I went and hung out in the marketing department, which was 17 buildings over, and got to know some of the people over there. I found some salespeople and learned how to do sales and went on some sales calls. I, you know, kind of used it as a, a little bit of a playground to, to uh, learn a lot. Um, I left Apple and went to a venture-funded startup, which was funded by, I don't know, 14 names on, on Sand Hill Road, everyone from Kleiner Perkins to MCA to AT&T to Time Warner to, anyway, just crazy amounts of money. Um, and we, we grew that uh, from 10 people to 400 people in the course of two years and took it public. First company to ever go public without revenue. Uh, it was just this crazy wild ride. It was really a bad idea. The strategy was bad. But I was a little young then and didn't realize it. It wasn't my strategy. The execution was good, but the strategy was bad. Um, and after that, I kind of struck out on my own. Okay, um, But that's the route I took. I went to the big company. I went to the little company. I learned a lot, and then I struck out on my own. Um, there's lots of formulas that have worked, um, but that's the one that I took and worked for me. Um, at Barracuda Networks, one of the key decisions I made um, was I took a very aggressive marketing strategy, which was kind of unfamiliar ground for me. Um, in particular, I was way ahead of the curve on online marketing. Um, we discovered Google AdWords long before most people knew what Google was. Um, and it was very effective at generating leads and, um, and revenue. But it was all done through this experimental method. You know, try it, see if it works. It works. OK, let's do more of that. OK, let's do more of that. Um, and then we, I also drove strong brand, which was unusual for a high-tech company. You guys all know Barracuda because of that strong brand. But that was very unusual in the time to use a lot of consumer marketing techniques for a traditional high-tech company. We ran radio ads. We run you know, in billboards and all kinds of things. But my hypothesis was is that there were enough IT people out there with the spam problem that actually going to that mass market media um, was actually worthwhile. And that actually proved um, very effective. Um, we were only able to do that, though, because we actually had the revenue and the cash to spend on that, OK, because we were watching the money. And we made sure that every spend actually returned enough leads and returned enough revenue because we actually measured it to actually make sure that it was working. Okay, so we used an engineering method or a scientific method applied to marketing. Um, the other major decision that I made um, that I think was pretty significant in my career or life was um, in the same year I founded Barracuda Networks, I founded another company called IC Manage. And I'm still the CEO of IC Manage um, and still run it. Um, and um, uh, I, managed to, um, I managed to do that, but it forces you to be very efficient. Okay? You have to basically do the things that are necessary to do, delegate the things that can be delegated, and only do the things that you really have to do to make the company successful. Um, so. Um, with that, um, the last thing I was asked to talk about was how Berkeley uh, influenced me and um, some of the things that Berkeley taught me. Um, so I learned a lot of things at Berkeley that actually did, did very well for me. Um, I was a, a research student doing my master's uh, on the fifth floor at Corey Hall in a semiconductor technology, semiconductor physics, semiconductor processing. But um, I still use a lot of the skills that I learned um, in those research days and doing my thesis. Um, one of them was about tackling the unknown and not being fearful of it and figuring out strategies for tackling it, something I learned uh, very much here at Berkeley. Berkeley also gave me a lot of experience of tackling really hard problems and breaking them up into small problems, applying scientific methods to do that. Um, and you need to do that when you're developing a new product. You know, any product, very few products can be written by one person or created by one person these days. There's some, 
okay? And if you can find one of those, that's great. You should go do it. Um, but a lot of the stuff takes a little bit more than that nowadays. Um, for those of you who to, um, and so I learned a lot of that while I was here at Berkeley. Um, for those of you who plan to pursue uh, the entrepreneurial path, I strongly encourage you to do it. Um, my first mentor, my first, uh, when I was starting my first, my second company, um, I was leaving um, Apple 3DO to do that. Um, I was discouraged by a lot of folks because it was a different day and age and being an entrepreneur was risky and scary and all of those things. And I actually delayed. Um, I waited in a year and I lost a lot of opportunity because of that, um, which is, you know, a lesson learned the hard way. But um, if you go strike out on the entrepreneurial path, you will, um, you'll, learn a new, you'll learn something every day, which is one of the amazing things about it, because there's always a problem, there's always something to tackle, there's always a new challenge, there's always a new customer, there's always a new thing you can add to the product, there's always something to fix, there's always a crisis, there's always something. Um, and you will learn to use whatever resources you have to solve the problem in front of you, because you don't usually have the resources that you want or need. It's no storybook kind of thing. You're figuring it out with a little bit of duct tape and bubble gum, okay, um, and whatever you have at hand. And you'll learn how to tackle the unknown because you'll have to do that as well. So I want to thank you very much for the invitation. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep. <laughs> um, and uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to, to take any questions that you have. Love questions. Um, my name is Guang, by the way, from the IUR department. And uh, I was wondering, so say you want to become an entrepreneur at the, uh, you know, later on, but you want to start at a startup to get some experience. Um, do you know, like, which role will, I think, best prepare you for that? I think any role is fine. Startups are small, okay. Um, you know, if you're five or 10 or 20 people um, person, there's a funny thing that happens. Um, so when you're five or ten or twenty people and you, you're you're getting your startup going, okay, um, everyone in the company knows everything. Okay, everybody knows what the marketing people are doing and what they're going to do. The engineering status, you know, you have a company meeting every Friday or every Monday, you know, and everybody kind of gets everybody clued in. It's very effective. If your startup company isn't doing the kind of sharing with everybody during those early days, um, do it because you'll be better off, okay? Because everybody needs to be a customer service agent if the phone rings. Everybody needs to be aware of what marketing's doing so they can get the right marketing message when they're on the phone with the customer. Everybody needs to be kind of on, on target in the company. And one of the best ways to do that is to just do a little 30-minute you know, company gathering every week, share some stories. You know, in, um, we kind of combine it. In, at Eagle Eye, we kind of combine it with Scrum. I don't know if you guys know Scrum. Um, but anyway, you software guys probably know Scrum from the Agile method. Um, but what happens is as you get a little, so I don't think it matters what role you do. What's interesting, though, is as you get to like about 100 people, 80 people, 100 people, it's not possible for everybody to know everything that's going on anymore, OK? And it will actually cause a lot of angst for about 10% of the people, OK? Because they were there in the early days. They knew everything that was going on. And now there's so much going on, they can't keep up with it all. And you know, they learn about this, and it's like, oh my god, I should have been involved in that. What are you guys doing? Oh my god. You know, and, and you go through this period of like a year where you go from, you know, 100 people to 150 people where you've got 10% of your people having a lot of angst over the fact that they don't know everything that's going on anymore. And they just can't because there's too much going on. Sure, over here.
Um, I think engineering gives an advantage over other entrepreneurs, um, but that's because I'm an engineer. Um, I think that engineers can also be at a disadvantage. Okay, I mean, to this day, I still do a lot of architecture checkups and sanity checks. Um, you know, I can I can talk in gory detail about the architecture of almost any Barracuda product um, and all of the Eagle Eye products. Okay, I'm, I haven't written a line of code in any of those products, um, but you know, I know the trade-offs between programming in Perl and Python um, from a business point of view, a maintenance point of view, and you know, and can can go toe to toe with any of my engineers on architecture, but. Um, where engineers always come up lacking is with what I'd characterize as respect for what the sales people do and for what the marketing people do. Um, and it's mostly out of lack of understanding of um, how the world works or how, what they do and how effective it is. You know, I applied in the marketing world and in the sales world, I was kind of maybe a little bit of a outlier in that I employ, employed a tremendous amount of engineering process to both of those um, disciplines. Um, you know, so we, we measured you know, close rates and lead rates and incoming rates and sales rates and all of these things. And we would change our messaging and then re-measure them and see if that messaging was better than this messaging. We measured all that same stuff on the website. A lot of people do that kind of stuff now. But most startups and, and uh, most, a lot of marketing people and um, salespeople, it's not innate in their skill set, right? Um, and so I think that the ability to apply the engineering process to those other disciplines, okay, you can't use it for everything, okay? Engineering process isn't necessarily going to give you the creativity um, for your next ad campaign. Okay, an engineering process isn't necessarily going to help you with a relationship sale. Okay, but in a lot of cases, you can employ a lot of process um, that I think is very beneficial. In the back there. Um, the question is, what do I know now that I wish I knew? Um, so uh, the story that, that comes to mind is the one I mentioned uh, a few seconds ago, which is I was uh, working at Apple. I had this idea for this product. I thought the world would like it. Um, and it was, it, was, it was solving a problem that I had, designing chips at Apple. And I went to the folks that um, you know, I kind of trusted and respected and said, hey, I'm thinking this is brilliant and that I should go start this company because I think it's, it's big enough that everybody wants it and da 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 And they said, nah, no, it's too hard. And um, I got very little support, um, and so I didn't go do it. And I should have gone and done it right away. Um, and, you know, had I had better mentorship or better advice or, you know, someone who had struck out on their own to coach me or, or, or give me a little bit there, um, I would have been better off. Um, and so, you know, one of the things is, is, you know, seek out a little bit of advice um, early on from somebody who knows what they're doing. The trick is, is you got to find somebody who actually knows what they're doing. There's a lot of people out there who want to give you advice who actually have no clue, okay, um, who haven't done it before or if they did it, you know, it was, it was in an odd way. Um, and you can't spend too much time getting advice, okay? It's worth about 5% of your time, <laughs> max, okay? Because remember, the most important thing is execution, and getting advice is not execution. It'll help you figure out the strategy and can help you with some bumps in the road. But getting a little advice um, or finding a sounding board when you have problems um, is a good thing. So. Over there. I never found a mentor, unfortunately. Um, I, I wish I had, or wish I could claim I did, but um, I never really found uh, any.
anyone who was um, the right connection for me. You know, if you're looking for someone who's going to be your mentor, okay, you could look a long time for that. You get people who will give you advice and give you a little bit of mentorship. That's why I say, you know, think of it as a small little thing to, to test. Don't think of it as a big thing, right? You know, there's the dream of, you know, oh, he was my mentor. He got me my first job. He coached me, trained me, and, you know, mentored me for 10 years. All right? I've never found it. I've never met anybody who's found it. Um, you know, it's a nice pipe dream. It's kind of like winning the lottery. <laughs> Over here. Well, passion, okay, so the question is, is if you have an idea and it doesn't look like it's going to make any money anytime soon, do you still go after it, even if you're passionate? <laughs> um, passion is really important. You've got to have some passion for what you're doing, some belief in what you're doing. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not liking your job, you're not going to really do a good job. You're not going to work at it. You know, I, I kind of give this quip uh, you know, people ask, how are you successful? And I say, it's one-third hard work, one-third being smart, um, and uh, I forgot the other third, and one-third being lucky, okay? Um, and if you look at most companies, it's, it's really a combination of those three things. The luck part is right place, right time. Um, you know, who would have guessed that WhatsApp would be worth, you know, seven or eight billion dollars? There's a little bit of luck in that. Um, so um, if you think the idea has potential and you're passionate about it, right, you know, go, go try it, okay? One of the things that you do as an entrepreneur is it gets back to this experimental method. You know, you can build something and then try and sell it. And if you can't get anybody to buy it, and, well, then you try and sell it a different way. And then you try and sell it a different way. And after you tried to sell it three or four or five different ways and you still don't got any buyers, then you give up and move on to the next idea. Okay? Maybe it's the timing's not right, the positioning's not right, whatever. Um, it's often better to try and sell it before you build it, um, which is a technique I've used at a few companies, but uh, not any of the current ones. But, you know, you kind of pretend you have it um, until you see if you can get a buyer. And then when somebody says, yeah, I'll buy that, and you get the order, then you run around behind the curtain and make it really fast. <laughs> um, because you don't really want to go make something and spend all your time and energy making something that nobody wants to pay you for, right? Because it's a waste of time and energy when you could have been doing something, opportunity cost. But you can't always do that. You know, one of the best ways, if you can, if you can pull it off, is you know to get somebody to give you, who wants your product. You got a relationship there. This is mostly in the business business side. It doesn't really work in the consumer side. But you know a lot of companies. You know PG and E really wants smart meters. Okay, and you know they've got an initiative for smart meters. Okay, they're willing to pay somebody you know three hundred thousand dollars to go and develop a prototype smart meter for them. Okay, well, holy cow! You can, if you can convince them that you're the right person to go make the smart meters for them, then. Um, you know, you can get your company off the ground with a contract or, or an order to kind of get it started. Um, I don't know if that's a true story, by the way. I just made that up, just so we're clear. <laughs> but it's it places like that where people have a severe problem and they don't have the capabilities to solve it necessarily themselves. So um, let's go right here. You mentioned that every two weeks or so you might have a new idea. Yeah. Um, for me right now, it's a little different. I'm looking for ideas that have um, significant size, okay, and have significant impact. Um, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, that wasn't important to me. I was looking for ideas that I could execute on um, a lower budget. So, um, part of it, so, so, uh, so size is one of the things that impacts me, but if I take that out of the equation, um, what you're looking for is something that you have the resources 
readily available or know how to execute. Okay, so let's suppose I have an idea, you know, I want to go make a, um, a video camera system that records everything in the cloud, but, you know, I don't have any engineers who know how to build really big data storage systems in the cloud, and I don't have anybody who knows anything about video. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to go, I don't got the resources necessary to go chase that one down, you know, or, so it's a little bit about what's available to you and whether you can muster the expertise to go after that idea. Um, the second thing is, is you can do a little market testing, okay, which I strongly encourage, which is, you know, surveys are a really powerful thing of, you know, it's better if you get outside of your group of friends, but you can start with your friends um, if it's something. But, you know, if you can find some potential customers and actually, you know, show them some storyboards or show them a, a user interface that's mocked up or whatever and get some feedback and, you know, try and get to the place about how much we pay for this, how much is this worth to you, okay? Not just do you like it, okay? You got to get to the dollar discussion. Um, because, you know, then they'll actually start to give you real feedback, okay? Before that, before the dollars gets involved, they're going to say, oh, I love it. It's beautiful. Yes, very wonderful idea, <laughs> okay? They're just going to be nice, right? You got to get past the being nice place to brass tacks, and one way to get people there is to actually have a dollars discussion um, so that you can get the feedback for real. Sure, right here. Uh, I would quit it as soon as possible, okay? You don't have any day jobs to quit. You're all set. You've already done it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that is um, independent of the company. That's independent of the idea. That is independent of, of everything. It is a personal capabilities decision, right? So if you've, you've got some way of surviving, um, do it as soon as you can. Okay, um, because then you'll be focused and you'll put your energy into it and it'll motivate you even more. Okay, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that want to be entrepreneurs and are working on their little thing at home on nights and weekends and it never goes anywhere because they never have the gumption to actually make the leap because, you know, it's too comfortable and, you know, it's scary. Uh, so it's much more of a, a personal kind of decision than it has anything to do with the company or idea. Sure, right here. Uh, my name is Destiny. I'm a social science uh, major in education okay. and public policy. One is to ask some advice on for like social sciences people like entering in the entrepreneurship realm. Like, where have you seen them being the most successful? Um, I have no idea. Uh, is my so his question is: Is uh, people coming from social sciences wanting to be get into the entrepreneurial world? What's the, the best way or uh, the best way to do that? Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, so the, the pain point that I have, and I think is actually a pretty hot topic in, uh, in all of the tech stuff going on in San Francisco and everywhere in the world, is um, user interface, user interaction. Okay, um, you know, it's, it's called UX design or, you know, whatever, whatever you know. it used to be called GUI design, now it's called UX design. Uh, but it's basically the, the interactions between the, the man and machine. Um, uh, Silicon Valley has kind of woken up uh, in the last year and realized that that is a make or break for consumer products. You know, they see things like Dropbox basically successful because the, the UX design is really good. Square, very successful because the UX is, is somebody put a lot of time on it. They see Apple killing it because the UX stuff is really well. I was kind of indoctrinated into UX at Apple and so, um, you know, had some experience with it. But in general, it's been a very weak point of tech companies. And the tech companies are kind of waking up and realizing that uh, they need to put some real energy into it. So that's where I would go. Oh, yes, I'll be around for another 15 minutes or so. Um, happy to chat with anybody who wants to chat. So thank you very much for sharing your contributions. We have a
Oh, for you. all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I have to run too. Um, but it was a great, it was a great talk. And there's a lot to learn from you. And uh, I have a lot of things that I like. So I would love to talk to you. Yeah. Okay. Great. great. Yeah, thanks. All right. Bye bye. Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, Good very, to see you. Very interesting. I agree with everything. Uh, I wanted to maybe uh, re amplify the question that one of the students asked, uh, which was okay, ideas are cheap because there's 7 billion people on the planet, and it's all about execution. I agree with all that. Uh, but then you have to be selective because there's so many ideas, so you have to be selective. And your answer was, well, let's do some surveys to find out which ideas are likely to be big and important. It's about passion and about ones that you think you can execute and about finding somebody who's going to pay for it. So, yeah. What about, what about other things? It seems like uh, there's, I, I'm still stuck with too many ideas for all that because I can be passionate about so many things. I'm, I'm